Hi, this is uh, one who is watching, otherwise known or referred to as Watcher on the internet. And this is the first in a series of YouTube presentations that will be about the history of early Mormonism and more specifically about the 15 and a half year public ministry of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Uh, this is a visual that I have uh, created that I will be using and as you can see I have divided this uh, 15 and a half year period into five very uh, distinct and identifiable periods of time. All of the uh, scriptural documentation for the information I'm going to provide is contained in a book that I hope to be making uh, available to the general public in about September October the name of the book is solving the prophet puzzle uh, transforming a crisis of faith into a spiritual awakening by documenting the true biblical profile of Joseph Smith and interpreting the latter-day restoration through a prophetic lens by the way if you'd like your own uh, PDF of, of this uh, timeline that I've created uh, that can be zoomed in and out of when you view it through Windows Photo Viewer. Just shoot me off an email and I'd be happy to send you your own uh, copy of it that you can kind of play with and use to uh, review the information that we're going to be covering. The uh, book that I'm getting ready to publish, along with this uh, series of historical presentations, is all part of what I'm referring to as the Third Watch Project. And the purpose of it is, is to help people to prepare themselves for the return of Jesus Christ and his servants back into the vineyard. And uh, Third Watch is taken from a prophetic passage of Scripture that is greatly misunderstood by people and, and that was changed in the Joe Smith uh, translation of the Bible. And we'll be getting into that a little bit more later on. But basically, the, the passage informs us that Christ comes to his vineyard three separate times as a, as a thief in the night without uh, the masses knowing it. And all three of these times take place before his second coming in glory. And so he, the first watch or dispensation took place... Uh, during the millennium of time, uh, when Christ provided the gospel and sent forth the twelve apostles, and that dispensation uh, is oftentimes called the dispensation of the last time or times. And then the second watch, or the second dispensation being referred to, is one that was secretly ushered in through the prophet Joseph Smith in 1836. And the third watch is when the marvelous work and a wonder begins and it's coming up very quickly. It, it could begin at any time. One of the things that differentiates the commentary that I provide in this series and in the book from other books or articles about the LDS restoration is that I'm going to present this historical information through the eyes of ancient prophecy. I will provide the prophetic narrative that provides context to all of the historical events that took place. Joseph Smith mentioned several times, and it's also mentioned in uh, the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple in section 109, that the events taking place during Joseph's ministry were all viewed and spoken about and looked forward to by all of the ancient prophets. They were all looking forward uh, and could see the events that took place in Kirtland, far west, in Nauvoo. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I have a, a cough that I haven't been able to shake. Uh, Joseph Smith's ministry uh, consisted of the fulfillment of many ancient prophecies. In, in fact, his 15 and a half year ministry uh, was basically the fulfillment of one ancient prophecy after another, after another, after another. And once you begin to realize that, and identify the fulfillment of these ancient prophecies, everything falls uh, into place and begins to 
makes sense and it becomes uh, a cohesive uh, lucid uh, history uh, if you don't understand those things it it's a uh, it's a very difficult history uh, to 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 really have faith in and that's why many people that begin studying the history of the church lose faith because it's very disruptive it's very bizarre there are just m many events that uh, that just don't seem to make a lot of sense but again uh, once you understand the prophecies that are being fulfilled it all makes uh, sense here's a, a another illustration I've <coughs> excuse me created and and believe me there are a lot more prophecies being fulfilled than just these six but this this is just a brief example so uh, we have the prophecy by John the Revelator in uh, in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation where John foresees that the New Testament church is going to go into the into the wilderness and uh, and, and that sets the stage for the restoration of the church through Joseph Smith so about 570 years later uh, the restoration begins to take place and the Book of Mormon comes forth and the church is formally organized and uh, and that's why in, in sections like section 5 <coughs> and section 33 the same keyword terminology is being uh, used so that we can link this up and, and understand uh, what's taking place prophetically so the, the New Testament church flees into the wilderness and then it returns and it comes out of the wilderness. And it just begins to come out uh, during a, a two-year period of time when missionaries were going forth and, and uh, taking the Book of Mormon and doing baptisms. But they're functioning uh, in offices that pertain to the two lesser priesthoods that are both lineal priesthoods. And we'll again this is just an overview this very first uh, uh, presentation we'll be getting into all of this in much greater detail in the future but I'm just doing a several uh, very general sweeps of this timeline to kind of give you an idea of what we will be discussing uh, one of the great misconceptions uh, in modern-day Mormonism has to do with priesthood and uh, the modern corporate church teaches that uh, two orders of priesthood were revealed through Joe Smith and that is simply not true there were three orders of priesthood that were revealed through him the modern corporate church teaches that the Melchizedek priesthood was restored through Peter James and John in about 1829 and again that that cannot be justified in modern revelation or in the history uh, of the church so uh, one of the amazing events that took place, which I've blogged about, is is the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood for the very first time at the special conference at the Morley Farm. And this is one of the great historical <clears throat> landmarks that we use to divide up and come up with these five different eras in the 15 and a half year ministry of Joseph Smith. This, this is another incredible prophecy that is being fulfilled. Uh, and, and it's not a coincidence that it is exactly three and a half years to the day from June 5th, 1831, when the Melchizedek Priesthood is restored at the Special Conference at the Morley Farm, until December 5th, 1834, when Joseph Smith receives the revelation from the Lord <coughs> excuse me uh, explaining that the both the leaders of the church and the members of the church were under condemnation and that they must have a reformation in all things this this three and a half year prophecy shows up in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation and and to uh, to kind of summarize uh, the saints are, are in some degree of darkness coming up to this three and a half year period of time and then they go back into a, a degree of darkness following that period of time 
so, so this is incredibly important. You, you need to understand when the full, what the fullness of the gospel is and when it came in. And this, this is going to be shocking to many people. You know, there's lots of people uh, who think that, that the rejection of the gospel uh, by the Latter-day Saints is still a future event. And although it is true that the fullness is going to come in again and that many Gentiles will reject it, the prophecies that talk about this, for instance, uh, when Jesus Christ makes this prophecy in, in 3 Nephi 16, and he talks about the time when the Gentiles will reject the fullness of the gospel, he is talking about this period of time between June 1831 and December 1834. Again, it's three and a half years to the day. And that's when the fullness of the gospel was on the earth and the Gentiles were struggling to embrace it and, and to continue on with it. And, and they were not successful. And this doesn't mean that they were less valiant, uh, that the elect among them were less valiant than the Nephites, Nephites that, Joe, that uh, Christ visited uh, in Book of Mormon times, in 3rd Nephi. Uh, we are told in section 86 that this dispensation is different from that one in that the Lord is going to allow the wheat and the tares to grow together until the time of harvest is, is fully ripe. Uh, in, in the Book of Mormon account, the Savior actually destroys the more wicked before he comes down. And it appears that the, the more righteous portion that were spared were those that listened to the preaching of Nephi and that were baptized and that were prepared for Christ's return. So it, it really isn't fair to compare the third Nephi account of when the fullness hit the earth <coughs> with the account that takes place during the history of the church beginning at the Morley farm. Now we're, there were some amazing things that took place uh, during this time, during this three and a half years of nourishment. We'll, we'll get into that later. Uh, but it has to do with the fact that uh, there actually were some people who became sanctified and received their calling and election and entered into the oath and covenant. Uh, if we move on to a, another amazing uh, prophetic sequence, uh, we, you know, the book of Daniel talks about a reconciliation for iniquity. And it has reference to an intercessory offering that a latter-day prophet likened to Moses uh, provides for Latter-day Israel. And it's similar to the atonement offering that Moses provided for ancient Israel. It's referred to in modern revelation as, uh, as the acceptable offering. Uh, and, and this actually kind of began a little bit earlier because people needed to become sanctified and they needed to get their calling election made sure before they could act as a savior on Mount Zion and, uh, and provide an intercessory atonement offering for modern Israel. Moving on to the next era and, and another major prophecy, we come to this amazing prophecy that Christ gave in 3rd Nephi. When he talked about after, just shortly after the Gentiles would reject the fullness of the gospel, uh, the Savior said, then the, a knowledge of the fullness of the gospel would be taken to the house of Israel. Well, as you'll recall, uh, Joseph Smith and the saints were anticipating to go forth for the last time in power, taking the gospel to the entire world right after the solemn assembly in the Kirtland Temple, because that's when they were supposed to receive uh, you know, their endowment, and then the great last missionary work was to take place. Well, that never took place, and the church kind of goes into a tailspin with regard to that anticipation, uh, and a whole year over a year goes by, and, and the servants of God are not going forth. And then all of a sudden, Joseph, makes, Joseph Smith makes this bizarre announcement that God has revealed to me that something new must be done 
for the salvation of the church. And what he's really doing, and, and, and right after that, he, is, he uses the apostate quorum of the Twelve Apostles to establish foreign missions. And I, you know, I say that they're apostate because the quorum of the Twelve was in total disarray. Three of them, of the original members of the Quorum of the Twelve, had already apostatized by the time Joseph Smith uh, announces that something new must be done. And, and there's so much turmoil that the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, President Marsh, petitions the Lord through Joseph Smith on behalf of his brethren, and the Lord acknowledges uh, that, that they're in disarray and that they, they really haven't even experienced conversion yet. And interestingly, President Marsh would then apostatize within a, a year or two after that revelation is received. And, and uh, in, in fact, at the time that Joseph Smith determines that this new missionary work, this interim missionary work, this is a different missionary work than the one that had been anticipated. This isn't, you know, the high priest going forth with fullness of priesthood for the last time. This is an interim missionary work. And Joseph Smith is. Uh, ordaining uh, somebody, I, I, I want to say, uh, I forget if it's, uh, I, I think it's Heber C. Kimball in, in the Kirtland Temple, and, and Orson Hyde, who was in a state of apostasy, comes in and hears about this and gets all excited about it, and <laughs> apologizes to Joseph Smith and wants to get involved in it, and so he becomes part of this new missionary effort, although he too would uh, apostatize for a while and then come back again but the point is the quorum of the twelve apostles uh, apostles was in just a terrible state of confusion and apostasy at the very time that they were being used to begin this this new phase of missionary work and so it's really quite remarkable if you if you'll read section 118 of the doctrine and covenants that represents the the beginning literal fulfillment of the prophecy that Christ spoke about in 3 Nephi 16 where he says after the fullness is rejected by the Gentiles Gentiles I will then take the knowledge and this is this is really important he doesn't say that you know they're actually going to personally receive the fullness he says they're going to get the knowledge of the fullness of the gospel well section 118 uh, gives a very limited commission to the twelve apostles and they can only do two things they can promulgate or publish uh, the fullness of the gospel uh, and then the second thing is they get to witness of the name of Christ and I've, I've recently blogged about this but it's this is so remarkable if you'll go back uh, in the doctrine comments to that revelatory sweet spot that you can see on the timeline and more specifically that three and a half year period when the false was on the earth they had actually received a commission during that time which was a much greater commission than what is being given in section 118 uh, back during the three and a half year period of time uh, they are told that the Holy Ghost will be speaking through them and that what they say will be scripture and uh, and they're told that they can not only witness of the name of Christ they can witness of Christ himself because Again, this is during the three and a half year period of time when it was possible for, and, and many people were, well, some people were having the heavens open and they were seeing uh, the Father and the Son, and others were just seeing the Son. But the point is the heavens were open at that time, and so the commission was a much greater commission. They were told that they could baptize, and, and people through their administration, people could experience the baptism of water fire and the Holy Ghost so we, we get this amazing limited commission that's given in 118 and the Lord commands them to go over the great waters and that is the full beginning of the fulfillment of this amazing prophecy in 3rd Nephi 16 <clears throat> again you can kind of see how once you realize prophetically what's taking place everything begins to make sense when when you don't have that prophetic narrative in the background, which provides the proper context, you really have to scratch your head and say, why in the world is, is the Lord sending the 12 apostles when, when they're in total disarray? 
I mean, Joseph Smith told the, the 12 apostles right before they went into the Kirtland Temple that their minds were so dark that Gabriel himself wouldn't be able to communicate with them. And, uh, and what many people don't realize is that a specific revelation given to the 12 apostles had told them that they were under condemnation. So this is quite an amazing event. Now, the, the last prophecy I'm kind of highlighting in this little illustration here is, uh, has reference to the fact that, uh, you know, the, when you get into the Nauvoo era in section 124, the Lord's really pretty upset at the Latter-day Saints, and he has them on probation, and he's telling them the fullness of the priesthood has been lost. And again, this so many people read section 124, and they don't understand what the fullness of the priesthood is. I mean, that's really the only time in the four standard works that one passage in 124 is the only <coughs> the only place where the phrase fullness of the gospel is used. So many people really aren't quite sure what the fullness of the gospel is or when it was on the earth or how or why it left. Again, this timeline chart explains it. But but the Lord let them know that if they didn't repent and if they didn't complete the Nauvoo Temple and restore the fullness of the gospel, that they would be rejected as a church with their dead. And, and that's what took place. The Latter-day Saints were rejected as a church with their dead. But the underlying prophecy that we're going to look at here is so incredible. What, what many people don't realize is that Joseph Smith was not the president and prophet, seer, and revelator of the church when he died. Hiram was. And that's one of the amazing things about section 124 is it, it makes Hiram a co-president of the church with Joseph. And that should have been a major red flag for everyone because way back in section 43, the Lord gave a succession protocol and a succession prophecy. And in the succession prophecy, it said that no one would replace Joseph Smith until he was taken as long as he remained in, in the Lord. However, if Joseph Smith was to, to temporarily fall for, for any reason, and, and we know from the atonement statute prophecy, you know, why he did need to, to fall, why he took upon himself uh, the sins of Latter-day apostate Israel. Uh, if he did fall, someone would replace him. And the remarkable thing about the succession prophecy is that it tells us that he, you know, if he falls and if he has to be replaced, he will be appointed by the Lord through the, the new successor would be appointed by the Lord through Joseph Smith. Now, up front, on the front end, that seems very strange. Because how, how can somebody, you know, go into darkness and fall, uh, you know, fall from grace or whatever, even if it's temporarily, and, and still you know, have the revelatory powers to to call and identify their replacement. And yet in hindsight, as we now look back, it all it all makes perfect sense. It it begins with a revelation to make Hiram his uh, co president of the church. And then what many people don't realize is that within a couple of years after that takes place Joseph Smith announces to the church that he is no longer going to prophesy for the church and that they must turn to Hiram. Hiram has the authority, he tells them. And people came up after that conference and complained about it and said, you know, we, we love Hiram and everything, but he's no prophet. And, and, and uh, it's, it, it's just remarkable to realize that Joseph Smith released himself as the president and prophet here of the church. <clears throat> but what's taking place here that I want to talk about <clears throat> having to do with this sixth general prophecy that we're talking about is that Joseph Smith becomes obsessed with becoming a king and a priest. And he begins holding these secret meetings and he has what he refers to, what people refer to as his secret measures. And <clears throat> the Quorum of the Twelve and many other people uh, start participating in these secret meetings and and, you know, 
they're becoming uh, kings and priests. And, and uh, Joseph Smith actually has himself ordained and anointed as the king of Israel. And, you know, I used to kind of just blow that off, assuming that Joseph Smith's mind was darkened. But I've, I've come to realize that he was actually fulfilling a, a major prophecy in the Old Testament where King David was promised by the Lord that his kingdom would endure and that somebody, a descendant of his, would restore his kingdom David's kingdom in the last days and that from that time on there would always be a descendant of David sitting on the throne until we get to the end when the servants come back in, into the vineyard and that's exactly what happened. Joseph Smith becomes the, the king. He, he establishes the kingdom, the ancient kingdom of Israel before it was split in two. So this isn't, you know, just the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. This is both. This is when everything was under the kingdom of Israel. Joseph Smith reestablishes that kingdom, has himself uh, placed as the king of it. And what many people don't realize is that Brigham Young did the same thing. When he became the president of the church, he had himself uh, ordained king over over the, uh, the kingdom of Israel. And he, his successor, John Taylor, did the same thing. We don't know if this has secretly been done and handed down from then on to the down to Thomas Monson or not, and it really doesn't matter because it's semantics that we're dealing with. Nowadays, we use the term preside. Well, that's what a king does. If, if there's a kingdom set up and established and someone is uh, sustained to preside over it, then they're, they're obviously the king over it. But the point I'm making is, if, if you look at that ancient prophecy, and you look all around, you know, the Ashkenazi Jews over in Jerusalem, they, they don't claim to have reestablished the kingdom, the entire kingdom. They, they claim to be the, you know, the, the kingdom, possibly the kingdom of Judah, still broken up. But they don't, they don't claim to have reestablished uh, this Davidic dynasty. And yet the Latter-day Saints fulfill this prophecy. Joseph Smith, uh, that's, that's one of the great things he did during his ministry, is he reestablished the kingdom of Israel. You know, one of the great prophecies that that really provides one of the most important keys of the of the prophet puzzle is the prophecy in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and and this is this is where Nathan tells King David about this incredible event that's going to happen at some time in the future where a descendant of King David's will reestablish his his throne and his dynasty and, and and it's so interesting to read all the articles uh, by your Protestant prophecy scholars because they always try to force uh, one of two interpretations into this prophecy they they always tell you that the person being referred to is either Christ or Solomon and, you know, if, if you go down the seven points, you realize it can't possibly be either of them. And in fact, all you have to do is, is <clears throat> continue reading uh, in Samuel and, and other of the Old Testament uh, prophets. And, and it becomes obvious that it can't be Solomon because the Lord actually appeared to Solomon three different times. And on the last time, he told Solomon that he would not be the fulfillment of this prophecy. And the reason for it is that he had uh, departed from worshiping the true God. He, he had married some heathen wives, and through their influence, he had begun worshiping heathen gods. So it, this definitely isn't referring to, to Solomon. It, it's easy to understand why people assume that it's referring to Solomon because the prophecy is about a descendant of David who would actually commit uh, iniquity 
and have to be chastised for it. And Solomon uh, committed iniquity. However, Solomon was not chastised by the rod of man. So that's just one more reason why it obviously isn't Solomon, and it obviously isn't Christ. For number for a number of reasons, the the most obvious one is that Christ never sinned either. So let's just quickly go down this uh, seven point prophecy. Number one, the Lord uses His Davidic servant to appoint the place and eventually plant Israel in it. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, uh, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. And let's just check it off one point at a time. A huge focus of Joseph Smith's ministry was identifying the gathering place and the places for refuge for Latter-day Israel. And so Joseph Smith did that. Uh, we, and then we have additional prophecies that show that, that there will be a second part to this calling uh, where the saints will successfully gather there. And, and once they successfully gather the, there, they will not be moved anymore. Point number two, the Lord's Davidic servant will establish the kingdom forever. A, des, a descendant of David will establish the kingdom after his death. When thy days be fulfilled, this is Nathan speaking to King David on behalf of the Lord, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. Uh, please turn with me to section 109, beginning with uh, verse 62 for just a minute. We therefore ask thee to have mercy upon the children of Jacob, that Jerusalem from this hour may begin to be redeemed. Now this is very literal. This has nothing to do with the old world Jerusalem. Nothing was happening with regard to the Latter-day Saints in the old world Jerusalem at this time. And yet something is taking place from this very hour. Why? <clears throat> because the Latter-day uh, Jerusalem is in Kirtland. Verse 63, And the yoke of bondage may begin to be broken off from the house of David. From the house of David. This is incredible. Something was taking place at this time, and the Latter-day Saints were clueless about you know, the underlining, uh, the storyline that was taking place in the background here. But this was all about the house of David. 64, verse 64, And the children of Judah may begin to return to the lands which thou didst give to Abraham their father. One of the great secrets is that America is the land of the Abrahamic promise, and that the true descendants of Judah needed to return to America. So we shouldn't be surprised at the fact that within about a year, year and a half after <clears throat> section 109 is given, Joe Smith announces, well, something new must be done for the salvation of the church to, you know, quoting from the allegory in Jacob, to keep the roots alive. Uh, and, and so we've got to establish missions across the great waters. Why? Well, because the children of Judah are now going to return to the lands that God promised them through Abraham. This is unbefreakin'-leavable. And that's what's taking place in Nauvoo when Joseph Smith becomes obsessed with becoming a king and a priest. He's, he reestablishes the kingdom of Judah, which incorporates both of the ancient kingdoms which had split. So remnants of the ancient kingdom of Israel, who were among the Gentiles, uh, i.e. most of the Kirtland saints, were now going to be combined with ancient remnants of the ancient kingdom of Judah, i.e. you know, remnants of the branch of the house of Israel coming from over the great waters, and that's what's taking place in Nauvoo, is you're having a, a combining together of these two remnants of a kingdom that had been split apart and in fulfillment of ancient prophecy a descendant of David was uniting these two different splinters of the kingdom together. 
establishing the kingdom and actually using the apostate quorum of the 12 apostles to begin this process and to become take the leadership role which in many ways takes makes a lot of sense I mean you, you need to realize that the kingdom of David and the kingdom of Solomon were not perfect kingdoms and those kings were not perfect kings and and they did wicked things and so when the apostles who are obviously descendants heirs of the of the house of David and and probably from the kingdom of, of Judah when they're put into leadership positions there's there's kind of a a seamless transition from the from the gospel of Christ to the gospel of Abraham and that and that's the secret dispensation that is ushered in on April 3rd 1836 is this dispensation of the gospel of Abraham very few people realize what it is or what the significance of it is but because the Gentiles has had rejected the fullness they now needed to be downgraded this is why there is so much Old Testament theology intermingled through the doctrine and covenants is that God foresaw this he, he knew there had to be a safety net he knew that the Gentiles were going to reject the fullness and that there would have to be a transition and that they'd have to go back to an Old Testament uh, dispensation where a, a high priest can go into the temple behind the veil and atone for the sins of Israel this is the this is what the office of the high priest was supposed to do every year annually was he was to go into the temple into the Holy of Holies and to offer up an atonement in behalf of sinful Israel and, and this kind of transitions into the end times about saviors on Mount Zion number three the Davidic servant will build the house of the Lord after the death of David someone from his posterity will build the house he shall build a house for my name that Joseph Smith fulfilled part three of this prophecy by building the Kirtland Temple <clears throat> the Kirtland Temple by the way was a multifaceted temple it, it had a, a lower court and a higher court and the higher court was meant for the higher highest priesthood and high priest and it was very seldom if ever used it never got to that point I believe it will be used in the third watch but it wasn't back then the lower court was for the lesser priesthood and it's because the Saints had been downgraded and as this begins to come together it's it's absolutely incredible point number four the Davidic servant becomes the Son of God sealed up to eternal life calling election quote I will be his father and he shall be my son that's simply Old Testament terminology for somebody obtaining they're calling election and becoming a son of God we you know we often speak in the modern church about how we're all you know sons and daughters of God but in the scriptures it tells us we need to become the sons and daughters of God and that's what this is referring to point number five the Davidic servant will commit iniquity after appointing the latter-day place of gathering establishing the kingdom and building the house of the Lord the, the Davidic servant will commit iniquity so in the passage it says if he commit iniquity and, and in prophetic terms it's basically saying when he commits iniquity we know this for several reasons uh, there are other translations of the Bible that are that are more specific about uh, that terminology but the most important thing is that the, the next two parts of the prophecy are are subtopics of committing iniquity so part number six the Davidic servant will be chastened by men for his iniquity quote I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men this is exactly what happened be because Joseph Smith uh, and we've discussed in other blogs uh, about in in Isaiah 28 29 when it, where it points out that the latter-day seers will have their eyes covered because of the iniquity of the people so this this uh, intercessory servant has to have his his eyes 
covered prophetically and he begins doing things that are wrong. And because of the things that he's doing wrong, people become very angry at him and he, he's killed. This is exactly what the martyrdom was all about. Joseph Smith begins this spiritual wife doctrine, which has no basis in the scriptures whatsoever. And I need to point out that there's a huge difference between biblical polygamy and celestial polygamy. Okay, Biblical polygamy never had anything to do with after this life. And it never had anything in the scriptures. When you read about biblical polygamy, it never has anything to do with having wives in the next world or with getting the qualifying for the highest kingdom in heaven. That's that's all. Uh, th there's absolutely not one shred of evidence uh, to find that doctrine in the four standard works. So this is an anomaly that's taking place during Joe Smith's ministry, this concept of spiritual wifery. And so that's all just a false doctrine. It, it is interesting that uh, Joseph Smith is reestablishing David's uh, kingdom, and David was a polygamist. <coughs> For that reason, you know, one has to kind of be open to the possibility that Joseph Smith might have reestablished biblical polygamy as a cursing for the people because that's that's really what it is polygamy was a temporal custom which was integrated into the law of Moses after the apostate children of Israel rejected the higher law and once they rejected the higher law they were given the lesser law which was to be a cursing to the people and there were many things in the lesser law that Moses gave them that that was a real cursing to them and you know, polygamy probably headed that list. Number seven, the Davidic servant retains the mercy of the Lord. Unlike wicked King Saul, according to this prophecy, unlike Saul, who will receive justice and judgment for his wicked acts, the mercy of the Lord will not depart from the latter-day Davidic servant despite his iniquity. Quote, my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. This is incredible. The, the Lord is telling us here that even though this Latter-day Servant is going to commit iniquity and that the Lord will use man to chastise him for the iniquity that he commits, he isn't going to fall under the, under the justice and judgment that Saul fell under. He would retain mercy. He would be like Moses. You know, Moses sinned a terrible sin. And because of Moses' sin, uh, Moses wasn't allowed to cross over the river, and he had to die. And yet God continues to refer to Moses as his beloved servant, who he loves. And, and this is the same thing that's happening here. Well, that should give us a clue that there's an, an underlying storyline that isn't being told in this seven-point prophecy, and I cover that in the book, and I've covered it in my, in my blog. Joseph Smith was ordained not only to restore the gospel and build the temple and, and bring forth the scriptures and do a number of different things, but a, a major part of his calling was to do an intercession for Latter-day Israel after they rejected the fullness. The, the Lord saw Joseph Smith weeping for Zion. And, uh, you know, whether Joseph Smith openly volunteered during his mortal life or whether there's a commitment he made in the preexistence, he was the one appointed, the primary one appointed. And I should point out that there actually are a number of people, according to the prophecies, it isn't just Joseph Smith, it's Sidney Rigdon and Hiram Oliver, a, a number of them. There's at least five of them that all participated in this uh, atonement offering, which is described in, in pretty good detail uh, in, in other places in the Old Testament, and, and it's all covered in the book. <clears throat> Many people are, are participating in this uh, atonement offering, or se several people are. Uh, once you understand. Joseph Smith, his role, uh, everything begins to fall into place. And this whole timeline begins to, to make sense. 
Okay, so be, before I wrap this first uh, session up today, I'd like to take a couple quick sweeps across this timeline, just showing you some trends. So in the first two-year period, <clears throat> this 47 revelations uh, has to do with the number of canonized rev revelations that Joseph Smith received during this first two years. And then uh, during the next three and a half years, he receives 58 revelations. So in that, uh, in that five and a half year period of time, that's why I'm calling this the revelatory sweet spot. Because revelations were just pounding, 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 pounding. <clears throat> but as previously discussed, the three and a half year uh, period when the fullness was on the earth comes to an abrupt end primarily for several reasons primarily because the the saints failed at the law of consecration and they had you know as you're aware about 20 percent of the canonized revelations uh talk about the urgency and importance of the law of consecration and how uh once people are given it and commanded to live it it is really serious uh when they stop doing it when they break that covenant uh, so, we shouldn't be surprised that during the next two years, only six canonized revelations come. And during the next four years, only 11. And during the Nauvoo three and a half year period of time, only three revelations. So, <clears throat> you know, if revelations would have kept coming at this speed during that next 10 years, there would have been 200 revelations. But instead, there was only about 20. Okay, this is not a coincidence. This is a trend. The heavens began to close once the fullness of the gospel was rejected, cumulatively rejected by the Gentile church. Another thing, another trend that we see is that when the church <clears throat> first coming, started coming forth out of the wilderness, it was called by revelation the Church of Christ. Once the Melchizedek priesthood was restored, the Church of Christ continued to exist, and the Lord continued to call it the Church of Christ. But all of a sudden, we begin to see the term Church of God show up in the revelations that are coming forth, and it, the two terms are not necessarily synonymous. It's true that the Church of God is part of the Church of Christ, but not all members in the Church of Christ are part of the Church of God. And, and if you understand the prophetic narrative and the, the true context of what's taking place, the Church of God refers to the highest priesthood. So the, the people that now are ordained high priests, are be, they actually become the administrative uh, people within the church. Prior to that, it was the presiding elders in the Church of Christ. Now, everyone that's called to be a high priest is actually the presiding elder in any of the churches that they're in. So the Church of God generally appears to have reference to uh, those who are being led by high priests who are in the appointed places in Zion or one of her stakes, and they are attempting to live consecration. That's what this term has reference to. <clears throat> uh, once... <laughs> During the very tail end, uh, right before the official stop date of the fullness of the priesthood, the Lord has Joseph and Sidney call a special conference of the church. And in it, they change the official name of the church. <clears throat> so it's changed from the Church of Christ to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And this is, this is hugely significant. I mean, what's taking place here is that the name of Christ is being taken out of the name of the church. And again, this makes perfect sense because the Lord had told them that, you know, once you receive the fullness and I command you to live the fullness, if you don't, you're not worthy to be called by my name. So now they're called the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And, and don't confuse this with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is a very specific event that took place in the in 1834 
uh, <clears throat> in in preparation for the fact that the the fullness was being rejected. And that's one of the amazing things as you read the revelations is is that we worship a God that has all time, past, present, and future continually before his eyes. And so you can be reading a revelation and and God will be speaking from the reference point of right then in temporal time. And then a few verses later, he'll start talking about what's going to take place in the third watch. Because he can already see everything that's going to take place in the third watch. And and so once you get this this context, the the Doctrine and Covenants opens up. It, it's largely a sealed book right now to people that don't understand the nature of God and don't understand the doctrine of the three watches. But once you begin to see this, it opens up and it's really quite exciting. So <clears throat> you can you can begin to see chronologically in the different uh, historical events how God is setting things up in a certain way because he knows what the saints are going to do. And that's what happens right here uh, <clears throat> towards uh, the end of the three and a half years, he he does the name change. Now, shortly after the name change, the saints begin reinserting the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the justification that the corporate church, the modern corporate church uses, is actually a revelation that happens uh, right in about this period of time, 38, 39-ish, uh, and they completely misunderstand that revelation because that particular revelation, and we'll get into this in detail in the future, hopefully, but the revelation was actually a prophecy about the future. And it was stating that in the third watch, there would be two groups of believing saints. There would be those that were living in Zion trying to live consecration. They would be called the church in Zion. And then there would be believing saints in outlying areas, and they would be called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So it really had no reference to at that point in time. But this is the justification that the, the modern church uses to call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What's interesting, though, is that several times in the documented histories of the church, you can see that the saints had started calling themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints before that revelation had even been received. So regardless of whether you interpret that revelation as a, as a prophecy of a future event or not, uh, it, it really cannot, it is, it's not justification for the Lord renaming the church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So this is really kind of, we see a trend taking place here. <clears throat> First, the church is, is restored as the Church of Christ. It then continues on as the Church of Christ, but there's an inner group of the uh, administrative high priests who are referred to as the Church of God. Then, after the fullness is rejected, <clears throat> the Lord downgrades the name of the Church and just calls it the Church of the Latter-day Saints. This is kind of interesting because according to one account, uh, it was a unit unanimous vote at that conference to have the name change. And yet, uh, in other uh, historical uh, snippets that we get, there there end up being people that actually leave the church because of the name change. They they realized how serious it was to have that name change. Then the church starts calling itself the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then we get to the fifth period, and the Lord tells them <coughs> they will be re rejected as a church with their dead, if they don't repent, uh, get the temple complete, and have the fullness of the priesthood restored to them. So again, we see a, a trend. And, and so the trend up here with the name changes matches the trend that shows that the heavens are beginning to close. I also want to just briefly mention uh, some really really important uh, things that that we'll be discussing in in future future parts of this series one of them is the covenant of tithing this is an amazing historical event that is hardly ever talked about in the church this is mentioned in, in the or it's documented in in the 
documentary, History of the Church, where Joseph Smith puts in the covenant of tithing and 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 tithing in the scriptures and in this context is synonymous with consecration so he's talking about making a a covenant of consecration and he says on the evening of the 29th of November I united in prayer with brother Oliver for the continuance of blessings and I would submit to you that he meant for the continuance of gospel blessings now why did he think that he needed to do something for to enable a continuation of the gospel blessings that the church had been enjoying uh, during the previous three and a half year period of nourishment and and what's fascinating about this is that this event takes place about one week before they get the revelation that notifies them that the church is under condemnation, both the leadership and the members of the church. And, and the revelation begins by saying, Verily, condemnation resteth upon you who are appointed to lead my church and to be saviors of men, and also upon the church. And there must needs be a repentance and a reformation among you in all things. So, on, on December 5th, 1834, the church is under condemnation. And what normally would have happened at that point in time, I, I am submitting, is that the gospel blessings would be cut off because they had failed in their covenant of consecration. So this, this, is, this is just incredible that a week before that, uh, Joseph and Oliver realizing that the church is cumulatively breaking the covenant of consecration and that that will end the gospel blessings that the church is enjoying. So they intervene. This is part of the intervention. This is part of the intercessory intervention uh, that we'll be talking about. So Joseph and Oliver enter together. Uh, into this covenant with the Lord and this makes it possible for the church to continue on receiving gospel blessings so they continue on with the mercy uh, of the gospel now why is this important and why did this have to be done we know that this didn't continue on we know that there's a, a period of time coming up when the heavens are sealed and the, and the Lord tells them the heavens are sealed but there are some important events in the future that the saints need to continue getting their gospel blessings in order to accomplish certain things. So if, if we move forward in the timeline by approximately three or four months, it brings us to April, which is when these incredible things take place in the Kirtland Temple. Mainly focusing on the week, the week that begins... Uh, on Sunday with the dedicatory prayer, and then on, on Tuesday, the First Presidency petitions the Lord behind the veil, waits upon the Lord, asking him if it's time to redeem Zion. And then on Wednesday, uh, and the prophecies in the book of Daniel refer to, to this event as taking place in the middle of the week on Wednesday. That's when the Psalm Assembly takes place. And the saints are hoping to get their endowment of power so that they can go forth in power with the final missionary work. And then, of course, on April 6th, on, on the next Sunday, is when an endowment takes place with Oliver and Joseph. And, and they have their, uh, their vision behind the veil where the Savior and, and three ministering angels appear to them. So it's... It, it, we're getting some prophetic context here, which is really quite exciting because it all begins to make sense. I, for years, I read about uh, that covenant of tithing and had no idea what it was talking about. Didn't understand why they felt like they needed to do it, and and now it makes sense. Uh, the Lord 
realized that they still needed to accomplish some things. There are some very, very important things that needed to be accomplished in the Kirtland Temple, and they needed to be accomplished while the gospel was still on the earth and access to gospel spiritual blessings were still on the earth. Now, it later occurred to me that those gospel blessings probably continued on even past April and, and the reason I into September and, and the reason I say that and, and this has to do with another incredible event uh, where the Lord promised Joseph Smith on September 11th of 1831 the Lord gives this five-year prophecy where he promises that Kirtland will be a stronghold for the saints for five years. And Joseph Smith ends up talking about this in a letter and telling people uh, about this, this five-year prophecy and how the drop-dead date for the redemption of Zion is September 11th, 1836. So this becomes a huge uh, milestone date for the church because they realize that they're going to have some spiritual, continued spiritual protection in Kirtland until September 11th of 1836. And if they are not successful in redeeming Zion by that time, they're in big trouble because that protection of priesthood hedge uh, that is around the church in Kirtland is going to be removed. And and in a future uh, part of the series, we're actually going to drill down and show some of the amazing events leading up uh, to that date, September 11th, 1836, and then the ones just following it. And, and it's going to demonstrate that, in fact, the priesthood hedge uh, or the stronghold, as it's referred to in uh, section 64, is removed from the church. Uh, but, but the church needed to continue on because of God's promise and the time frame that he set up. They needed to continue on with his uh, grace and with gospel blessings to give them the opportunity to do what they could within that time frame. Another thing we're, we're going to hopefully cover is, is the fact that there are nine prophetic time sequences in the book of Daniel that all fit in perfectly to various time sequences and associated historical events in the history of the church during this this public ministry of Joseph Smith and and, and this I, I know this is going to probably create some indigestion for a lot of people because I think most people read these uh, very cryptic uh, prophecies in the book of Daniel and I think we all just kind of assume well that that's going to happen at the very end in, in the very last generation of time but it is remarkable to realize that they all of these actually took place during Joseph Smith's public ministry. And it's really exciting to see how virtually all of these either included or are closely related to the date of, a, of April 3rd, 1836. The book of Daniel really focuses on the significance of of what's happening in the Kirtland Temple. And it has to do with this great uh, transgression that's taking place by God's people. It mentions, uh, you know, the covenant of tithing. It gives a timeline from the time that God commands the temple to be built until it is built. Uh, it talks about the sacrifice and oblation that is, is performed for the last time. It talks about the confirming of the covenant. So many exciting things that all happened during the history of the church. And this is briefly mentioned in the dedicatory prayer, how prophecy, the prophecies of the ancient prophets, 
were literally being fulfilled at that time. All of this taking place during this uh, 15 and a half year public ministry of the prophet Joseph Smith. This, this is amazing. Uh, the, the next time we, I think in our, the next part of our series, we will uh, zero in and I'll talk about these amazing historical mind milestones that I'm using to divide up the chart and we'll talk about uh, some characterizations that we use to explain what's actually taking place in each of these uh, each of these five periods during Joseph Smith's uh, ministry and another thing that we'll do I have uh, I have a kind of a, a chronology of events historical events that take place very important uh, his, uh, his, historical milestones that take place and there just happen to be the same same number of them as there are letters in the alphabet so what I did is I put them down here chronologically and then and then I linked them up on the timeline and that's what these letters are here and this is incredibly helpful in getting context and chronology down because it all begins to fit place and and fall in line for instance, if we if we go to this chronology and we look at uh, oh L yeah, L uh, a revelation is received in February of 1834. So remember, this is uh, two thirds the way through the the three and a half year period of time when the fullness is on the earth, and the Lord makes this declaration. He says, "The kingdoms of the world will prevail against." Uh, the saints if they are not obedient and, and that's in section 103 and it, it's a conditional prophecy that it actually says if they're obedient the saints will begin from that very hour to prevail against the kingdoms of the world but if they aren't then the kingdoms of the world will begin to prevail against them so you go to L takes you to L on the timeline and it's kind of fun because you can kind of you know get get a perspective of the other events that are taking place right here and and so you know it makes so much sense that the Lord's telling him towards the end of this period of time okay one of two things is going to begin to happen right now you will begin to be the fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel where the stone rolls forth and smashes all the kingdoms of the world or the kingdoms of the world will overcome you and that of course is exactly what happened from this point on the kingdoms of the world began to overcome <coughs> excuse me <coughs> the Latter-day Saints even though great things were accomplished the kingdoms of the world are overcoming the Latter-day Saints and this this is uh, very consistent with uh, the very one of the major uh, markers that I use is this promise that the Lord gave in March of 1829 if this generation harden their hearts I will deliver them up unto Satan the Saints were literally being delivered over to Satan kind of beginning at this point but it gets progressively uh, stronger by the time we get to uh, to Nauvoo uh, it, it just really gets dark and one of the greatest ways of delivering the saints over to Satan and, and it makes so much sense that if the Lord's going to deliver the saints over to Satan how would he do it who would he do it through well naturally he would use his his prophet to do it with and and that's what I'm suggesting is that the Lord used Joseph Smith to deliver the saints over to Satan for a little season this really is not quite as ominous as it would appear because it's for a specified period of time and the little season ends up being about four generations and that's why we live during such an incredibly exciting period of time is that the, the four generations are about up <coughs> the little season of chastisement was also to be a little season of learning 
This is so exciting. This is why the scriptures are so important. Uh, it was This is the time, this four generations is a time for us to be nourished by God's word. And I just recently did a, a, a blog on this of how important the word is. The Book of Mormon that has come forth and the Doctrine and Covenants uh, have so much power in them. If, if we will read them and believe them, uh, they have the power to prepare us for the third watch that is getting ready to be ushered in. This marvelous work and a wonder. And what's really exciting, and we'll get into this in in some later parts of the series, is that these major things that, uh, you know, this major event that took place in September 11th of 2001, this directly links up. I'm going to show you some exact timelines that you can back up from this date to some specific events that took place during the history of the church. And what I'm saying is that everything that's happening right now, all of the prophetic events that are taking place right now in our world around us are all linked up to and because of what took place during the 15 and a half year ministry of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith's uh, intercession simply delayed things for four generations. And then at the end of four generations, they pick up where they left off. It, it kind of creates a, a time warp, if you will. Because it, what's interesting is if, if you go back in the history of the church, right at the time that the fullness was being rejected, the, the Lord starts talking about things, terrible things that are coming on the earth uh, at that time. And how the, the devourer was beginning to, to go forth and, and everything. And then, and then all of a sudden, strangely enough, it all seems to dissipate and things go on for, for four generations. But what happens is at, at the appointed time when the intercessory atonement uh, safety net expires, all of that stuff begins uh, surfacing again and it's already started surfacing it started surfacing years ago and 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 that's why when when Isaiah says we're talking about Isaiah 24 the earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws changed the ordinance broken the everlasting covenant <clears throat> he is talking he's talking about why things are going to start getting ugly here and he's referring to this period of time right here when the laws were changed and the ordinance was broken. The everlasting covenant was broken. This everlasting covenant is all-encompassing. It includes the covenant of, uh, between man and God of baptism, but that encompasses every commandment that's given, including... The law of consecration. You'll recall that <clears throat> during this uh, two and a half year period of time, the Lord said to the saints, hurry and get to the Ohio so that you can get my law. Because the enemy is combined. The enemy is ready to pounce on you and wants to destroy you. And the only way you're going to avoid being overcome and destroyed by the enemy is to receive my law. So they get they get to Kirtland and they get the law. The law is in section 42. One of the most important parts of the law in section 42 is consecration. They needed to live communally just like the New Testament saints did. That law was broken right here. Interestingly, another very important part of the law was the marital law of monogamy. So we shouldn't be too surprised to find this during this dark period of time in Nauvoo that people start secretly practicing polygamy again they're break they've broken the law <clears throat> the earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws changed the ordinance uh, in a future part of the series I'm going to show you how the ordinances were literally changed from the book of commandments published in 1833 to the Doctrine and Covenants, published in 1835, 
we will we will actually see changes in wording and ordinance and it isn't a coincidence this is what Isaiah was speaking about I've just gone over an hour and I apologize for that I'm just as long-winded when I talk as I am when I write so I'm gonna bring this first uh, first installment to an end <coughs> I mentioned earlier that uh, this book is going to be available in September or October to the general public but it's actually available right now to anybody that would like to help out and be on my peer review I'm, I'm opening up the opportunity for anyone that would be interested to participate in a peer review of the content of this book so uh, on my website I have a special password and a link that you can go into you just click on the link and then enter in the password when you get to the website and you can order this book and I'm ex looking for any kind of feedback whether it has to do with spelling and grammar or uh, whether you have issues with any of my doctrinal or historical or uh, prophecy related interpretations uh, I'm going to use this next 60 60 to 90 days to open it up to the peer review to give me uh, feedback and then I will make any final changes and then I will uh, provide this book to the general public assuming that uh, that uh, traditional distribution networks are still intact in 90 days but anyway <clears throat> whether you are a reader of my blog or uh, I, I happen to know that there are some uh, some LDS apologists and historians and uh, scholars that frequent my uh, my blog and I'm I'm letting you know right now that you're more than welcome to participate in this I know that you know several of you apologists are, are going to want to uh, do critical reviews of this after it's out and my suggestion to you is uh, it makes a lot more sense to uh, be uh, to participate in the process and uh, you know if you disagree with something uh, explain to me why I'm, I'm open to any criticisms it would be better for you in, in your objective uh, to prevent things from being in the final uh, publication than to just whine about it after it's published uh, so uh, anyone that's interested is is welcome to participate again I'm, I'm sorry that I've taken so long but, but let me just say this I'm, I believe if, if you've listened to the, the general sweeps that I've made and you understand and believe what I've said I believe you have a better understanding of who Joseph Smith is and of early Mormon history than any living Latter-day Saint uh, scholar or apologist or general authority has ever written about any articles on history that have been written uh, by those people uh, are, are written without the proper context and they don't have the the prophetic narratives that provide the context and once you understand the context everything begins to fall in place and you you understand uh, the truth about what what really took place in in history uh, and I, that's not to say that you have a, a, a greater mental database of of historical events that took place I'm not I'm not saying that I'm just saying you know there are historians and 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 scholars out there that have spent their whole lives reading uh, the scriptures and about the history of the church and, and they're absolutely befuddled they, they really just don't know how to put it all together because it doesn't make sense until you have the 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 true context behind everything and so if if you've understood this you now have a foundation for putting everything together and you can actually take any virtually any controversial bizarre historical event you can plug it in the timeline and it's going to begin to make sense to you and, and we're going to cover this in in future uh, parts of this series we're going to go over <laughs> several of these things the book of Abraham 
the, the book of Abraham is going to make sense to you. You know, the, the secret visitation behind the veil in the Kirtland Temple. There's, you know, false teachers out there now that are telling you that section uh, 110 is false. And once you understand this timeline, you will realize it's, it's not only true, but it's one of the most significant events that ever took place. And that it's one of the missing keys of the, of the puzzle in linking everything together. It's so beautiful, so incredible, so true. And it exposes the uh, telling you to discard it and to have doubts in it. Section 110 is amazing. And, and it pulls everything together. Anyway, uh, I'm going to wrap this thing up. Thank you for listening and keep watching.